For all of your insurance needs, look no further than our primary sponsor, Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. The ATX OG has been insuring Austin for over three decades. And get this, Jim Saxton is a Longhorn legacy. He is the son of the late, great James Saxton, who was a Heisman finalist. Be sure to give him a call or better yet, visit his website, saxtoninsurance.com and tell him that the stories inside the Man Cave Boys recommended you. Wake your Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. You were t- I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, nah, I bet not. So you got a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> A pretty special podcast today, episode 154 with this guy. And I know what you're thinking. If you know me really well, you're probably thinking Clinch is being extremely biased today, having to have somebody represent with the SFA Lumberjacks. But this story is about perseverance, a dream, and why not? That's pretty much going to be the theme of this episode. Jonathan Buckets Shusky. First off, my man, how did you? Where did the uh, the nickname Buckets come from? Um, so I, we've been here uh, in the Columbus, Georgia area, uh, right here at Fort Benning, um, gosh, for like nine years now. And um, part of the time that I was here, I was an instructor at Fort Benning, which means that I, I had a little bit more time off than normal infantry work and you know in deployments and all that stuff. So. My job basically consisted of, you know, waking up early, go do PT, go run a range for a bunch of basic training privates for, you know, maybe four to six hours. And then I was off work by like two o'clock. Um, and for a good portion of that time, like I'd go to the golf course or, or whatever. And it was, it was kind of a nice break from all the deployments and stuff like that. Um, so uh, there, there was a local ESPN affiliate here in Columbus, uh, 95.7. And um, I, I listened to them every day from four to seven. They had a show on there called The Press Box with Bobby Z. And um, I listened every day, called in every once in a while and talked to Bobby. And then one day Bobby got in touch with me. Uh, he actually hit me up on social media and he was like, hey, man, I enjoy whenever you call in. Um, I'd really like for you to come in and, and, and sit in and, and do a show with me. And I was like, I've never, uh, never done sports radio or anything like this. I was like, hey, my buddy sit around and have pretty good conversations or whatever but um so he invited me in went in and did a show and we did that like a couple of times like i did like three shows in about two weeks and then finally one day he was like hey man what if you just become the permanent co-host and and come do this with me every day uh so i talked to my command they were all cool with it and so i became the co-host of the press box and and did that for quite a while that happened in january of 2015 Mm -hmm. Is that right? I think 2015. Um, that was right around the same time that like Deflate Gate just started. Like that game had just happened, and so like that's really where we took off from was Deflate Gate. And and Bobby and I had I'm a huge Tom Brady fan, uh, and we had some really good back and forth about that. And then we got into March Madness, and so we picked our bracket. We did an ESPN deal where everybody could sign up and do their own bracket or whatever. Um, that year, it's the year that Kentucky was undefeated, went to the yeah. Final Four. They lose to Wisconsin. Duke beats Michigan State, and, and then Duke beats Wisconsin. Um, I picked all but two games successfully in that tournament. Wow. Uh, and both the games that I lost, both games I lost were in the first round. Uh, I had the entire Sweet 16, the entire Elite Eight, the, the Final Four, and picked the championship. Um, and so somebody called in like later on that week after the national championship and um, <laughs> they were, I think they were trying to play off of uh, the kid that played at Creighton. Uh, they called him Dougie McBuckets. Uh, oh, McDermott. Uh, I think his name was. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so some, some dude called in and started calling me Johnny Buckets on the show that day. 
And, um, and, and then like more callers as the next couple of weeks went on, like that name kind of stuck. And then eventually I shortened up and people would just refer to me as buckets when they would call in. Um, and then my friends started calling me buckets. And then, uh, he was only like five at the time, but then my son called me buckets one day and I was like, so I think this is, I've never had a nickname before, but I think I've got one now. And so it's just kind of stuck, man. And like, that's like friends, family, like all those people, um, like that's what they call me now. So I'm, I'm buckets for, for better or worse. I love the stories behind the name. And so that's what this, our VIP guest, this is Jonathan Shusky has a story which will resonate. There's multiple facets, multiple seasons, multiple chapters of this story that's going to resonate with almost every demographic, every background, especially if you're a truly devoted American. Um, before we move forward, I, we got to give a shout out to uh, this episode's sponsor, AC, uh, excuse me, Honest AC and Plumbing. Uh, Chusky, you're, you're in the South. You know how unbearable the heat can be. This Texas heat, which you're about to learn about, uh, coupled with the humidity. You know, we've been over triple digits well over a dozen times already. Um, Honest AC and Plumbing, they're located on the northern outskirts of Austin. And they're old school, meaning they believe in that handshake and meaning that it stands behind their body of work. They're also, you know, for basic plumbing. That's what a lot of people forget. But give Honest AC and Plumbing and tell, tell them that uh, ask for David Bowers uh, and tell them that the stories inside the man cave sent you. Um, I'm Sean Clench, the host, if you're not aware by now. We're 154 episodes in. So. Shusky's story, he's 40, he's 40 years old, he's about to go play college golf. Well, he has already played college golf, but he's he's going to transfer or has transferred, and he signed recently with my alma mater, Stephen F. Austin. But to unbundle this story, we got to give a salute to him the day after the most patriotic day in American history, that being July 4th, the independence of religion, the independence of for freedom. People forget that. It is a significant day. And I want to pay tribute to our guy, Jonathan Shusky, right here. Just show you a little bit. He was in the United States Army. And this guy right here misspelled his last name. Forgot the E on the top part. <laughs> Shusky, your time in the Army, and we're going to break it down. Um, you didn't just train and serve in the United States domestically. You were on some pretty hostile front lines. Am, am I am I correct on that? Yeah, um, I, I did uh, a few tours uh, in Afghanistan, and and honestly, it's you know I know some guys that like later on in their career um, they don't the deployments kind of change a little bit, and and they maybe have a position that doesn't require them to kind of be out there on the front lines, you know, on patrol every day and stuff like that. Um, I tell people, um, I, I retired as a staff sergeant, um, probably should have retired with more rank than that. But, uh, um, I, I've never been much of a, I, I, how, what's the best way to put this? Don't know when to keep my mouth shut all the time necessarily. Is that, uh, and I, and I was never really much of a yes man. And so, being a staff sergeant in the infantry, um, you're, you're a squad leader, man. And, and so you're out there every day. And, and I was, you know, uh, that, that's a young guy's job. Like I was a staff sergeant back in my early twenties and was still a staff sergeant in my uh, late thirties. And, um, and, and so, yeah, so like, you know, those first couple of deployments, you know, when you're 20 year old kid, um, it's one thing, but then I went back again in 2018, um, as an old man is what I felt like anyway. And, uh, and, and still doing the same job and, and in a combat advisor role. And so, so yeah, so over the course of two decades, like I, I, I mean, I was in Afghanistan pretty much from the start of my time in the service all the way up really to the end. Um, and then like some, some other deployments like to the Philippines and a lot of people don't even know that we did combat tours in the Philippines, but we did. Um, back in you know 2005 six seven that that kind of time frame and and basically we're over there like hunting down like smaller terror organizations or whatever you want to call them um 
that were I, I <laughs> the best way I've found to describe it to people is uh, they were like the minor leagues of terrorism. Like that's they were <laughs> they were trying to get called up to the majors. Um, and, and so they, you know, like they were you know doing kidnappings and roadside bomb or whatever. And and so uh, spent some time like we we uh, I, I took a team and we were embedded with some special forces guys there and. I got to learn a lot about that community and the way they do things, and and um, and it's a heck of a lot different than the way us normal army infantry guys do things. And so yeah, I mean, over the course of twenty years, saw a lot of stuff. Um, the army didn't lie to me when I when I enlisted. They told me that I was going to get to see the world, and I did. Not necessarily parts of it that you want to see, um, but I, but I did. I got to go see the world, and uh, but yeah, I, it was uh, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Well. I- I want to thank you for your service, brother. Um, I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of the response that uh, what appears to be the majority of our country. We have a lot of people who appear to uh, verbalize their anti-American sentiment without realizing what all has taken place uh, and, and what you guys have really sacrificed and any regardless of branch of the military i've been tied to uh i'm come from a military family and so i i've received that discipline my entire life even though i broke the trend and went to stephen f austin but i don't i don't regret that part but uh thank you thank you very much appreciate it yeah but I, I guarantee the majority of the viewers and listeners all of them here of stories inside the man cave feel the same way i do you created this right here. So, so tell well, me a little this, bit about your family there. Well, this photo was actually right after that last deployment in 2018. So th- this photo is a little, a little old, um, <laughs> but it's my, it's one of my favorite photos. Cause my kids will tell you, dad loves the stuff. Like me and the kids, I'm always getting selfies with them. And, and I do that stuff all the time. This was the first time I had been able to get everybody in a selfie, like all together. So it's my favorite picture. Uh, we were actually on a cruise ship and, and, and doing that right after I got back from that deployment. Um, but no, uh, my wife and I met, uh, in Hawaii and, um, w- while we were both stationed there, um, she is, she's from Michigan. She's from, from up, I mean, like in the sticks up in Michigan. And, um, I think I've got her fully converted. I, she's a Southern girl now. She, she, she tells me that she's never moving back to the cold and the snow and all that stuff. And, and thank God, cause I don't ever want to live there either. Um, no. <laughs> but yeah, she, she's from, she's from way up North. And then, uh, my kids, they're all a little older than they, than they were in that picture. Austin, who's got the hood on in the background, he's 19. Um, he just like his father will be a sophomore in college next year. Um, <laughs> which is always really fun discussion in our house, but, he going to school right up the road here at Columbus State, and um, he's doing like computer, whatever computer software. What I mean, he's smart, way smarter than me, and he had to have gotten all that from his mom because because I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's going to school for that. He's he's actually in New Hampshire right now, um, where I was going to be this summer. Uh, he's actually working as a camp counselor and a lifeguard at a uh, Camp Wanaki, which is a, an all boys sports camp uh up in in new hampshire um so we're super proud of him and and he's having a good time up there and then bella who's all the way over on the far side there um she's 16 and we're about to get a driver's license for her which is frightening and it should frighten every one of you who are on the roads anywhere near us um but she's she's the she's the athlete in the family uh she Played basketball for a while. Play uh, plays softball right now. Um, she wanted to try out for volleyball, and I told her absolutely not. Like we're doing too much as it is. She's a manager on the football team. Like, and I told her I was like, we've got to like we're just going to keep it at those things, and we're gonna we're gonna let volleyball go. Um, she's also like five feet tall, like just five feet nothing. And I told her, baby, not a whole lot of five footers make it in volleyball. You're gonna you're gonna struggle <laughs> there. Um, and then Addison who's kind of down there and below with the little cat ears on in that picture um she's she's the most like her mom i think she addison enjoys her time curled up like with a book or watching a show and just will kind of seclude herself uh a little bit from everybody else uh, 
And um, and then Aiden, who is ten now, is uh, he he's my parents' wish. My parents used to tell me when I would act up as a kid, um, when you have when you have kids, I hope they're ten times as bad as you were. Oh. <laughs> Mission accomplished, mom and dad. Like you did it, you nailed it with that one because he is a firecracker. Like the kid never stops and. If I could figure out a way to bottle up his energy and sell it, I could be a gazillionaire. I mean, the kid is, he's always moving. He's, he's up early, goes to bed late. I have no idea how he has all the energy that he has. He's constantly, dad, let's go play basketball. Dad, let's go do this. And, and so the summertime is really fun. Like I get to go out and shoot hoops with him and stuff. And it's nice to be home and, and hanging out with him and, and all of them. Um, and then my wife is, unbelievable man like you know for all the time that she she's active duty when we met we were both stationed there in hawaii um and while we were at fort campbell we were in two different organizations we got put on alternate deployment cycles um so basically i was going to come back from a deployment and she was going to leave to go on a deployment and she said there's no way man and it's not happening so she got out of the army and went and, and worked on her education stuff a little bit and then she worked as a DOD civilian for a while um, and literally just left that job back in like February. And, and she's now working in the, in the civilian sector now as a paralegal. And um, she like, so not only during all the time that we were active duty and that I was in the army after she got out, like she was always the homekeeper and, and keeping the kids, you know, back and forth to school and to practice or this or band rehearsal or whatever was going on. But now that I'm retired and should be taking some of that load off of her. Well, now I'm going to school and playing college golf and she's still having to do all that stuff. And um, I'm telling you right now, if our roles were reversed, the kids would be doomed. Like there's no way I could do like, <laughs> and keep up with all the stuff that she does. Yeah. And I mean, it's incredible. I call her Wonder Woman, man. Cause she, yeah, she I don't know how she keeps all of it together. And, she, and you can, I, mean, I can bring her person here right now. She didn't have a planner, an organizer, nothing. Like she just remembers all this stuff um, and knows when it's happening and what time and where to be. And it's incredible, man. So yeah, it's, um, I, I'm enjoying the summer and being here and hanging out with them. And, uh, but you're, you're right. It's, it's my favorite of all the things that I've done, like soldier or sports radio guy or golfer, or I played in a band for a long time. Like of all the things, like being a husband and being a dad, like always going to be my favorite. And um, just I'm just happy to get to spend some time with them right now. I've got to ask as I bring this picture up. So um, Jonathan is, I want to say so Staff Sergeant Shusky. You, you'll carry that with your title forever. But you had a dream. And a lot of people just give up on it, and you don't hear about it. But the the reason why I, I just think this is so special because I think there could be some inspiration from this, from to you to for people to see this. And that tweet right there pretty much speaks volumes of why we're even doing this episode. You know, you said you're not finished until you quit. When did this idea come up? when you approach your fourth decade of life to say, you know what? I am going to fulfill that dream that I, I wanted to do. And that's to play golf in college. So I've got a buddy uh, and, and we met uh, actually met through the, the radio stuff that I was doing. He was a, a listener and he's lived here uh, in Georgia, Alabama, you know, his whole life. Uh, he's a football coach, been coaching football for 37 years just retired from teaching. So he's getting to just be a coach full time now. And um, he and I became friends to go uh, back in, we, we became friends back in 2015, like while I was doing the radio yeah. stuff and while he was coaching and, and another one of the hats that I got to wear for a little while was I got to go and, and coach with him at Lynette high school, right up the road here in Lynette, Alabama. Um, we, we won two state championships in the four years that I was up there with him and, and, uh, you know, a lot of really good players and really good coaches. And I mean, it's just a really awesome program. Um, they, they've got a kid that's at Alabama right now and got a kid at Oregon playing in the secondary and, and got kids all over, uh, as far as like Juco D3, D2 on up. And, uh, it's this little tiny school of like 200 kids, like tiny little high school that you would pass by it and never even see it. Um, 
but this incredible athletic department there. And so while he was coaching there, um, and, and he's he's a reader, man, and he he's always reading uh, books. That I, I can't remember the guy's name, the, the book that kind of gave him the, the spark behind Be Elite. Um, and you can see it in that tweet, and you'll see it in a lot of the tweets that I, that I post that Be Elite. And he talks about that all the time, and it's something that he talks to his players a lot about, and it's something that he and I – spend even right now like we'll get on the phone and talk for an hour you know or whatever and talk about this stuff and really what it boils down to is being the best version of yourself um and the the goal in being the best version of yourself is to be better today than you were yesterday and be better tomorrow than you are today and it's really that simple um and, and we talk about that stuff all the time and the things that we think takes to be elite and so the idea to play college golf kind of came from that you know we were we were talking one night about kind of what my options would be when when I retired and I remembered having a conversation with a guy in 2019 at the Armed Forces Championship we were in right outside Phoenix Arizona at Luke Air Force Base and uh as we were playing you know we're both coming up on retirement he asked me what I was going to do and I had thought about a bunch of different jobs, like going to be a contractor or like there's some money to be made in that stuff or, you know, security, whatever. Oh, yeah. uh, and then I thought about potentially maybe going and doing like the PGA golf management program and, and doing something like that. And he just happened to mention, he was like, well, if you do that, some of those schools will let you play college golf. And I was like, I can't play college golf, man. I want to be like almost 40 when I retire and just left it at that. And so those conversations with, with Chip, um, you know, the more we talked about being the best version of yourself, and I kept asking myself, is the best version of me going to be sitting behind a desk from nine to five every day? Is the best version of me and, and, and the things that I think I'm capable of doing and, and, and the message that I want, you know, to get across to people, am, am I going to achieve that, at, you know, doing these other things that I had thought about doing? And the answer was no. And so I decided I'm going to go play college golf. Like I, I, I've, I've enjoyed the game of golf, you know, since I was about 12 years old and my dad and I played all the time, played, started playing with a bunch of guys that went to church with me. And, um, and, and it grew and, and to, into something that, you know, throughout the army played on the all army golf team a oh, few yeah. times and, and did stuff like that. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to go play college golf and, and, but I also decided like for, like to get this message that I want to get across, like, like, what's your reason? Like, what's your why for wanting to go do this? And mine was really three things. Um, number one, because I'm a competitor and I, my kids, and I know they're joking, uh, but I don't know if they know that it really fuels me sometimes. They'll call me old man every once in a while. And, um, and we laugh about it, but it, but like, honestly, if I'm being honest with myself, like deep inside, every time they call me old man, I'm like, there's nothing you can beat me at. Nothing. I don't care how good you like my 19 year old man. He's, he's athletic and he's in really good shape. And I tell him all the time, like we can go for a, a five mile run, whatever you want to do right now. You can't beat me. You can call me old man all you want, but you can't beat me. And he can't, and I won't let him. And I don't know if it's because I'm too stupid to let him beat me or if I really am, uh, you know, the animal I think I am or whatever, but I'm a competitor. And that was reason number one. I want to go compete against these kids and, and I want to try to beat them, man. It's, and it's going to be hard, and that's the thing that attracts me to it. Number two was veterans. And I, I watched these guys get out of the military over the course of my 20 years, and guys would retire, or their time would just be up and they didn't re-enlist, or whatever the situation was for them getting out of the Army or whatever, they didn't have a plan. Like, there was no plan at all. I watched guys that, you know, would fall into depression and start drinking or doing drugs or whatever. Um and a lot of it stems from this idea that like their military service was like the end, like, well, what do I do now? I'm not like, I'm not qualified to do anything else or whatever. Um, and there's this, there's this mentality almost that like, like it's their identity and it's the only yeah. thing they know is I've been a soldier or a Marine or whatever. Uh, and there's nothing else for me. And, and my goal is for those people to understand, like there's so much more to do when you get done with your military service, man, I'm, I'm 40 years old and getting ready to go play division one college golf, man. Like, give me a break. Like whatever it is you can think of, you can go do it when you're done in, in the army. And the, the great thing is when you're done with the military, 
whatever it is you decide to go do, they have all these resources for you to be able to go and do it. And they're, they're going to try to help you go do it. So, so gr- like reason number two was for that group of people. Like just to, if I inspire right. just one or two people to go do something else after the military and, and, and follow a dream or a passion or whatever, then that's what I want to do. And then reason number three was just my kids. Um, I, I don't want to be the cliche parent that tells us kids that ah, you can do whatever you want or you can be whatever you want to be or be a dreamer. Like, I feel like we tell our kids that stuff, but like after we tell them that we go tuck them into bed and then we wake up the next morning and go to a job that we hate and you know, whatever. And like, are we being dreamers? Are we doing the thing? Like, are we following that advice ourselves? And I don't think we do sometimes. And so I'm in a position that's very unique and, I don't have to go work a nine to five job every day. I get to like, I, it's summer. I told you the other day, man, I get to just make pizza rolls for lunch every day and, and go play golf and whatever. Um, but the other thing that I get to do is for nine months out of the year, I get to go to college and play college golf and show my kids instead of just telling them, I get to show my kids, you really can do whatever you push your mind to. Like you might have to move some mountains to do it. And there have been some obstacles along the, along the way of this thing, but, um, I'm just, I'm not going to be the, the parent that tucks them into bed and tells them that stuff. I'm, I'm going to let them watch me do it. And, and, and hopefully they learn it that way. So yeah, those, like, that was really my why. Like, why would you want to go play college golf? Well, there you go. Why not? <laughs> you're, you're, you're about to be a sophomore at age 40 and that, there's nothing wrong with Weird that at year. all. <laughs> so I love this. I love this journey you're taking. You're, you're going to my alma mater, which, uh, for those watching, uh, Outside of the great state of Texas, you're in the middle of uh, in, in, of the Deep South. Uh, great football country. There have been great golfers come out of there in that area. But uh, Nacogdoches, Texas, it's uh, about four hours east of Austin, northeast, northeast. It's in the middle of the Piney Woods of East Texas. It is the, how can I say this, the front door to the, to the South. As far as the landscape, it that's what I mean by that. Yeah. So it'll look very familiar to you. I mean, with the pine yeah. trees, um, incredible people, incredible basketball facility, basketball practice field, football stadium, the football, all the, the athletics is pretty is on point. Um, so for you to leave your home uproot, you were in Memphis away from your family, but to go to an unknown place like Nacogdoches, Texas to learn the culture and to pers- continue to pursue that dream and your family and your wife, number one, being so supportive of that. I mean, how did this happen? I mean, how did you find Stephen F. Austin as an option? Well, so I, I left Christian brothers there in Memphis. Um, and, and, and the goal was when, when I told them I was going to transfer, the goal was to find something closer to home here in Columbus, uh, and I don't know, I, I didn't think things through very well or, or whatever, but I, I, you know, I, I entered the transfer portal and then I started talking to some coaches and some different folks and there weren't, there weren't a whole lot of spots available. And the thing that I didn't really think about was like, you're doing this in May and everybody's done recruiting and like they, they've kind of got their roster set and they're already ready to go for next year. And um, I was like, man, yeah, this, this might not work out the way I wanted it to. And so, the places that I had kind of had on my, on my you know, kind of targeted that were nearby, um, nothing panned out. And so I talked to a couple of schools that were in the same conference as Christian brothers in the Gulf South, uh, that were, you know, a little bit more local to us here and Christian brothers, uh, decided to block me from moving to one of those schools, uh, which they had every right to do. Like it's part of like the conference doesn't stop you from doing it, but the school that you're leaving can make you sit out for a year. And that's what they chose. And, um, and I tell people like, like, I'm not mad about that decision. Like, I mean, it, well, let me, let me rephrase that. Like it did piss me off a little bit. Um, but I understood like, I, 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 like I completely understood why they would do that. And, uh, so then I had to kind of try to figure something else out. And so I started talking to some places a little further away and kind of opened, opened up my recruitment, if you will. That sounds like a weird thing for a 40 year old dude to say. Um, <laughs> and so I actually, I have a friend that, that, um, I, you know, I, I think 
he's the one that kind of put me on their radar uh that you know he's a tournament director and 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 does some different stuff and but anyway they got in touch with me and 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 we talked a little bit and uh we actually had an official visit set up and we'd been talking for you know a few weeks or whatever and we had this official visit set up and coach calls me one day and they're kind of putting together the last few details of this thing. Um, and my wife and I had already talked about, like I was just six hours away in Memphis. Now I'm going somewhere where I'm going to be like 10, 11 hours away, uh, driving anyway. Um, and this is a big move. And, and my wife had already told me, well, we had had a couple of conversations. The first conversation was the one where she told me I was an idiot. And we had that conversation almost daily. <laughs> But she told me, like, if you if you pass up an opportunity like this, like, you're an idiot, man. Um, the second thing that we talked about was, like, I had a couple of places that were closer to home here, uh, you know, NAIA, Division Three stuff. But the, the thing that, that I thought about the most was, like, the whys that I just listed, like, kind of getting my message to other veterans and, and, and all those things where am I going to be in the be the best position to do that as well? And, and so, so we, we'd had these conversations and we're setting up this official visit and coach, is, he's called me up and he's, he's getting like some last minute details or whatever. Um, and then finally while we're on the phone and we're trying to work all this out, I finally just told him, I said, coach, like, let's just, let's just be honest. Like we can save ourselves a lot of time and, and headache or whatever, like there's not really any need to do this visit. And I, and I think that caught him off guard maybe just a little bit. And I said, I'm, I'm in if you guys are in. And he said, well, we're in. Uh, and he asked me a couple of times, like, you sure you don't want to come for a visit? And I, and I told him, I remember saying, you know, like, unless I show up at, you know, it's Stephen F. Austin and you guys have got like dead bodies littered all across the golf course. Like, I don't know what you're going to have that to scare me off, man. Um, I've been to, I've been to some pretty bad places in the world and I'm, I'm pretty easy to please now, you know, when it comes to, <laughs> to where I'm comfortable, you know, living for a while or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, we, um, you know, I verbally committed that day and then, uh, we, we did the signing stuff and, uh, actually my buddy Chip, I actually was in his neighborhood when they sent the stuff over for me to sign. So I stopped by his place and, and signed that stuff. And, uh, and yeah, so, now I'm, I'm ready to get down there and be a lumberjack. I've already got the, I got the beard going and, uh, wife, wife bought me a plaid shirt. So I'm in, man. I'm, I'm ready to be a lumberjack. Shusky, this is the segment which you see a lot of red faces. They're not prepared for it, but manscaped.com has done a tremendous job marketing across the great country of ours. And they've reached out to podcasts across the country and stories inside the man cave uh, was uh, partnered with them. So as we've all learned to evolve since that great era called COVID um, evolve, they have done it with their products, all the combinations, but the latest and greatest, my friend, the ultra smooth package. And I mean, the captions are brilliant. Shaving care for down there. Okay. That's right. So I always say, my friend, that uh, <laughs> our significant others would prefer us not to resemble the German black forest below the belt. That's right. I'm just, so this little, this little package, it, it, they, they've, they've gone through, you know, because there's a lot of companies which cater to, I feel like a kindergarten teacher at story time. Uh, Oh. Cater to women's health, you know, a shower, bath, but who does it for men? Nobody, that to my knowledge. But to sum up this package, we got the crop exfoliator. It's for buffing and soothing. Then you go to step two, crop gel lubricating and moisturizing. Mm -hmm. Then you got the great razor. It's only that big. And that's all you need it. Size is not always the solution. So there you go. The ultra smooth package. And if you go to manscaped.com today, use this promo code right there, mancave20, uh, one word, and you get 20% off. You think that would be uh, uh, the lumberjacks would be a good marketing target for that? 
Yeah, I mean, as long as you're as long as you're not targeting this area, like this, this area right here, I, I'm gonna I'm keeping the beard. And I, you know, somebody asked me one day, they were like, "Is that just something that everybody does when they get out of the military? They grow a beard?" And I said, "I don't know about other people." I said, "I grew mine out to hide this half of my face." Um, and I remember telling you I was doing the, I did the radio stuff because yeah. I didn't have a face to television, and that's why I, that's why I stayed on there. So yeah. I, I don't want to manscape any any of the beard, but yeah, every guy, every guy's got to you got to you got to take care down under, or uh, the the missus the missus ain't gonna be ain't gonna be real thrilled about it. Hey, this is how we wrap up the first segment: the man cave story, sponsored by Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. Is there a certain short story that you love to tell that remains comical to this day? It could have been while you were uh, in the U.S. Army. Or one of your golf, in, maybe in the clubhouse, so to speak. Uh, a short story that remains comical to this day. Boy, I don't know. I can tell you, I, I actually wrote a paper about this in college, and this is a true story. I, I've told the story of people that just did not believe it. Um, it's my absolute favorite story to tell, though. So my dad and I, uh, this is when I was young. I was probably eight years old we're in uh we were in his uh i think we were in his work van one day yeah. and and i was just tagging along this is during the summer and my dad made a wrong turn and he ended up going the wrong way down a one-way street um he immediately recognized his error and swerved it into a parking lot and was like Whew, avoided avoided disaster until about four seconds later, a cop pulls in behind him, blue lights on, and and the, the cop got out of his car, and he comes up, and he talks to my dad, and, uh, you know, ask him all the, you know, license, registration, all that stuff, and, and my dad complied, and um, the officer says to him, he says, sir, do you know why I pulled you over? And, and my dad said, yeah, I think I do. And the officer said, well, you were going the wrong way down a one-way street. Uh, he said, didn't you see that arrow? And my dad looks up at this man without missing a beat, and he said, arrow? I didn't even see the Indian. <laughs> and <laughs> Oh, my God. I, and I, I tell people this, all, like, that's a true story. Like, that's a thing that happened. And the, the two of them, I, I think that's why I have such an affection for dad jokes now. My kids will yeah. tell you. I tell dad jokes all the time. Um, and it started that day because I watched him and this police officer just knee slapping together after my dad said that. And, um, and so I tell my kids, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to always tell dad jokes because dad jokes will get you out of a ticket. Um, the 40 year old college golfer, new friend of the pod, that being Jonathan Shutsky. We're going to take a quick break. This guy is quite knowledgeable of college football. I mean, he's from the deep south. He has to. I mean, Gotta, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about that other professional golf league. I want to get your take on that as well. This is ought to be interesting. Hey, segment two is coming up after this break. That's the sweet sound of frigid air to help us make it through this Texas heat. But if you experience issues with your AC and are sweating inside of your own home, you need an honest and locally owned company to make those repairs. Now, I know of a place which is not only locally owned, but veteran owned too. Honest AC and Plumbing prides themselves on their handshakes and their quality of work. If you live in North Austin or in any of these northern suburbs of the ATX, give the boys at Honest a shout. Be sure to tell Floyd, Will, David, and the staff you're a loyal stories inside the Man Cave podcast viewer and follower. This is JJ Gotch, CEO of the Austin Gamblers. And segment two of Stories Inside the Man Cave is next. Basketball and football. I played other sports growing up, but golf offers you that you don't think there's nobody else for you to rely on on the golf course it's just you man couldn't have said it any better brother i mean that was 
eloquent, truthful. I mean, this guy, I mean, people don't, I, I'm going to be upfront and honest here. For you to have the opportunity at relative, I mean, you're younger than I am, but we're still in that same decade. For you to even have the opportunity to play at a Division I university such as Stephen F. Austin, you, you have to have some skill, you know, advanced skill. But when you, it's your passion. What else can you add to that as why it's one of your passions? Well, it's, I mean, it's the only game where you, like, you don't have referees, man. Like, you call penalties on yourself. Um, and it's everything about the game of golf, but whether it's the, the rules. And, look, I'm, I'm one of those people, like, I think some of the rules are maybe a little outdated or a little silly or whatever. But yep. at the end of the day, the, the, the basic part of golf, the, the integrity of that game and, and how it's played and the way it's officiated by the players that are playing it, it's not like a street basketball game where you can you're calling fouls on each other because you've seen how those end. You know what I mean? Like that ends with you know somebody throwing a punch sometimes at the golf course. Whether you're playing on the PGA Tour or whether you're just out on a Saturday with your boys, um, like those penalties aren't like they're not ever really questioned. Like you you right. get it into a hazard, you take your drop and you take your penalty and and you go on. And and so I, I've always loved that part of it. I love the individual part of golf as well in, in that you know in basketball you know all five guys have to be and and don't get me wrong when you go to play college golf there's definitely a, a team aspect to it as well um but at the end of the day i'm responsible for my golf score i, I don't have anything to do with the other four guys and, and their golf score that day um the only thing i can do is show up and play that golf course the best way i can play it and there's nobody there to help you, man. Like there's not, there's nobody for you to pass to in a big moment. Um, but you know, the defense, the defense isn't going to create a turnover for you to get back in the game. Like it's just on you, man. And that is name, image, and likeness and endorsements. Um, I don't know how this is going to affect you, but uh, I think that you could be a model. You could for a model as in how it's supposed to be done for college golfers. I really, I mean, here's Swing Juice you're affiliated with. I love the NFT and possible Buckets logo for Under Armour. I know it's not official, but when you try for the, okay, I want to start out with this by asking you this. So name, image, and likeness is so far past due for people who are fighting it and not accepting it. Any college athletic program, especially Division One who is not affiliated or have boosters who are not making proposals under the NCAA gray area guidelines, your programs are going to be so severely behind. And that includes FCS programs like Stephen F. Austin or mid-major basketball or mid-major golf. If those who are reading about it start creating a collective right now for all of your programs, especially baseball, for God's sakes, 11.7 scholarships. But for you, Jonathan, I mean, yeah, you're 40 years old. Yeah, you have business experience. You you know how to market yourself. But what I'm seeing right here, 18 to 22-year-olds can go out and find their own brand endorsements as long as they're not representing or promoting their program. How I mean, you're a very – how can I say this? ambitious guy but is anything i just said that you can elaborate on am i wrong about any of that no look it's i can tell you and, and anybody that's paid attention to what's going on with college football specifically um it's it shouldn't surprise anybody that texas a&m landed the number one recruiting class in the country mm -hmm. in in football um it shouldn't surprise anybody that the University of Miami, who I think just a couple of weeks ago was like 38th or 40-something or whatever as far as recruiting goes, they've got a top 10 class in the country for next season's class right now. Um, Texas just landed a Manning, for God's sake. Like Now I want you to take the schools that I just mentioned and look at what they're doing when it comes to name, image, and likeness. And I, I – like. There are very, it's a very obvious connection to make. 
Now, you can feel about NIL however you want to feel about it, whether it needs to be regulated or, or a little bit more than it is or whatever. And I'm not going to dive into that because that's not my place, man. Like, there are yeah. supposedly smarter people than me that are supposed to be putting all that stuff together. Um, but I, what I will tell you is that there are schools that are doing it the right way. And, and look, I mean, you can call it cheating or I, I, like I hate people throwing around, oh, they're, they're just paying players. Well, yeah, that's really, it's really exactly what they're doing. These companies are, are, are offering college athletes a way to make money on their name, their image, and their likeness. And mm-hmm. I, I remember Todd Gurley uh, played at the University of Georgia, great running back. He served a suspension while he was at Georgia, and the suspension was because he signed some memorabilia that was going to be auctioned off or whatever. Like, this guy got punished for putting his name on something. And and I remember thinking that was really when – I don't know if my mind changed. I don't know if I felt one way or the other, honestly, until then. But I remember that stuff with him and with Johnny Manziel and with others. And I remember thinking to myself, like – being able to tell somebody that they can't make a profit on their own name off off of just themselves seems like the most un-American thing I can think of. Like, I can't think of anything that's worse than telling somebody you don't have the freedom to use your own name to make a dollar. It just seems silly to me. So, so allowing athletes, college athletes, this opportunity, I, I think it is the right move. I think a lot of people have a very twisted view of the college athlete and what they get or don't get or whatever. And, um, and look, I'll tell you this. I was a division two golfer at a small school in Memphis, Tennessee. All right. I'm not playing linebacker for the university of Alabama or USC, a, a division two golfer. And I'm going to tell you, I woke up at six or six thirty most mornings to get some sort of workout in, go get breakfast, go to class, as soon as class is over, grab lunch, go to the golf course and practice. As soon as you're done with practice, you're back home trying to get homework done, write a paper, whatever it is you got to do. Then you got to eat something, take a shower, maybe get time to have 30 minutes or an hour to yourself to watch TV or watch a game or whatever. And then you go to bed and you do it all over again. So the people that tell me like, oh, they're getting a free education and they're getting you know free room and board. Well, first of all, they're probably not because unless you're playing football or basketball, like I, there aren't unlimited scholarships to go around for all these other sports. And, and, and what, I mean, there are what, 85, is that what you get? Division yeah. one football, you get 85 FCS, guys. Yeah. And then FCS 63. So yeah. The other 20 or however many guys on that roster, they're not like nothing's getting paid for, for them. Like they're paying their own way through that wow. place. And the, the people that, I think there's a there's a group of people that honestly just they they turn on their TV at noon on Saturday and they see a football game and then when the game's over like, it, like do they think that's it like the football players just show up and play games and then it's like go party for the next six days like no way man like this is a job and if you don't think that they should be able to profit from doing that job the school's not paying them the school's giving them that education and the room and board whatever. Let them be able to make some money off their own name and image because I'm telling you, I've worked full time. I've worked full time before and playing college golf at a Division two school in Memphis. I worked some longer days doing that than I did at a job, man, in in the Army, for God's sake. So imagine what it feels like if you're at a program like Alabama or Texas or, or I mean, even at Stephen F. Austin, man, like if you're a football player, bad, like those guys have crazy schedules that I don't think people really consider what those athletes are doing. So um, I I think it's one of those, and I say this to folks a lot, um, if you're uneducated on a subject, which I think many people are about what college athletes Mm -hmm. do and don't do, maybe just sit it out and shut up. (laughs) (laughs) PGA versus the Live Tour. I want to show you something before we get our guy Shusky to talk about it. I thought it was absolutely hilarious, and it shows – how the older some of the older golfers like Greg Norman tossing out beers to the gallery <laughs> at, at a lift yeah. pro tour. <laughs> it was like a fraternity party 
at the 18th green, pouring Heineken down a guy's uh, throat. So what's your take so far? I mean, at first I was resistant just because that's how human nature is. But now I kind of – I think the Live Tour is – disheveling all of those old oh you got to be a certain way when you're out in the golf course it's marketing marketing to a younger demo is that do you, do you agree with me on that or well i, I think it's they're they're really marketing toward a couple of things is what i think i think first of all yeah so let me take you back and i gosh this is probably further back than i'm willing to actually say uh, <laughs> you remember the movie you remember that movie happy gilmore right Yes. The movie, oh, the movie Happy Gilmore, remember what happens as Happy starts kind of taking over the tour? The, the people that are coming out to the golf course, they've got the, the beach balls, and they're drinking beer. I think at one point, Happy gets flashed by a lady. Like It, it turns into a party, and then there was Shooter McGavin saying, this is golf, people. Go back home. Shanties, I think is what yeah. he told the crowd after he made a putt. Um, that like the evolution of that, like we've seen that happen even on the PGA tour. Like think about every year when they go to Arizona and play the waste man, the, what is it? The waste management yeah. open is what yeah. they call it now, whatever at wow. Scottsdale. Think about the 16th pole and, and what happens there every year. Like, there's not a quiet moment. It's built like a stadium pretty like you got like 20,000 people sitting around this hole this year there was a hole in one and people are throwing beer cans all over the place. So golf <laughs> is kind of golf has invited this new kind of crowd in. And I, look, I'm not any kind of elitist when it comes to golf. Like I want everybody to play golf. And I think I do too. if you people like the PGA tour, like they talk about grow the game all the time. Um, but I think maybe sort of kind of like the NCAA, like maybe we're not talking about grow the game as much as we're talking about grow your wallet you know um and and there are maybe certain people that they don't really want to be a part of what they're doing and so i do think that live golf is is appealing to those folks like i think the people that were there in portland this week had a really good time at that event um but the thing that i think a lot of people are missing is i think live golf do i think it's ever going to overtake the pga tour absolutely not man um, they might not ever broadcast anywhere than just on a YouTube stream, and that's okay. I think it's really about the event and the people that are behind the event. The Saudis are looking to do business, man. And so there's a golf tournament going on, and you've got the concert at, at the end of the round each day, and all the different, you know, all the the different amenities that they've got set up around it. That's really what it's about, like. There are business deals going on at these events that the Live Golf Tour or whatever they're called, like that's what they're really in this thing for. I don't think it's about turning a profit. I don't think it's about, you know, overtaking the PGA Tour. I really think that it's just a business thing, man. Like they're doing business and making deals with these things. Before we wrap things up, we do this thing, quick draw questions. I'll say something oh. quick. You answer with something quick. Quick draw question number one with Shusky. Um, the national ch- who will be the national champion in college football from the SEC? From the SEC, or will it be an SEC program again? Yes, and I have to say yes because if you bet against them, you've lost more than you've won in the last two decades. So I'm gonna say yes. Why do you think Texas and Oklahoma will be able to compete in the SEC whenever that year happens in 2024 or 2025? Uh, why do I think? Yeah. Well, I think the brand has a lot to do with it. Um, there, there are certain teams in the SEC right now that can compete, like Ole Miss. Like We've seen Ole Miss have some success. Um, and, and other programs, but I'm telling you, you're bringing two really big brands and two really big recruiting powers into that conference. And I think you're going to see some of those kind of middle, mid-level teams in the SEC that have, you know, almost gotten there. You're going to see them kind of get sifted back down toward the bottom when Oklahoma and Texas join in. What are you looking forward to the most about living in the dorm at age 40 at Stephen F. Austin? Uh, 
living uh, see that's the thing i'm i'm gonna have a room uh, like i'll have a dorm room but i tell folks unless i'm doing homework or sleeping i won't be there very much i'll be at football games and basketball games and golf practice and class and um i i won't spend any time in that room when i tell you i'm coming to get the full college experience i mean i'm talking i want to be in the student section and i want I'm going to be watching football and basketball and I'm going to go to sporting events and, um, and, and be part of the community. I'm not, I'm not coming there to see the inside of a, of a dorm room for any longer than I need to. So. Hey y'all, Kevin Hutchison here with Realty Austin and I am grateful to be a part of Stories Inside the Man Cave, a homegrown podcast just like my own business. Hey Ben, tell me something good. The 40-year-old college golfer who I cannot wait to watch. I'm glad you're representing the purple and white. Tell me something good that you've seen going on in your world or something that you would love to pass along to combat all the negativity that we're subjected to on a regular basis, it seems like. Well, I tell you, I saw something uh, just a couple of nights ago. And look, man, I know there's a lot going on in the world, like whatever – Whatever political stance you take or, uh, God, that we divide ourselves over pretty much everything yeah. in this country at this point. Um, and, and look like however you feel about, you know, the way things have gone lately, you know, everybody knows the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I know there are a lot of women in, in the world that maybe don't don't feel great about that and don't feel great about how they're viewed or their individual rights or whatever. Um, the something good that I saw, and I, and I wish that people would get back to this it, rather than watching the news and media coverage and stuff. I was sitting on the couch and in our little den uh, just around the corner. Um, and they didn't know I was there. I was kind of hidden down on the couch laying there looking at my phone and I overheard my wife and my 16 year old daughter having a conversation. And my wife was holding court, man. Um, she was, I mean, they, they covered a range of topics and women's issues and um, things that I, I like, I wish that every man could have been a fly on the wall in that room and kind of, cause she, she gave a master class on womanhood that evening that I got to kind of yeah. sit there and, and listen to without, without anybody knowing. And, um, and I wish we'd get back to more of that, maybe a little bit more of us sitting down and having those conversations with our kids or with each other rather than yelling at each other on Twitter or, you know, watching the Sean Hannity's and Keith Olbermans of the world yell at each other. Um, the, the something good for me is just, I mean, just a conversation, man, like two people sitting down and, and just knowing that like we're going through it and, and let's, let's help each other through it, you know? And, um it was man it was just good to sit there and listen to the two of them talk and and her offer up wisdom like i I mean saying stuff in that room that like i sat there and listened to and went man i didn't didn't think of it from your perspective the way i probably should have or whatever so um so that would be my something good that that night was incredible for me as a dad and as a husband well this has been a a great episode in the fact that I feel like we've learned and, and the viewers, listeners can watch this and say, you know what? I saw this podcast and his name was Jonathan Shusky, 40 years old, playing golf, fulfilling a dream, served our country, supportive family, father, husband. And they're so supportive of him. Fulfill your dreams, especially if you're in that, have that opportunity because if you – Give all the reasons why not to. You're going to regret that one day. And Jonathan Shusky, he is not going to regret that because he's at least given an opportunity. And, man, congrats. Best of luck to you, man. And uh, having been a Stephen F. Austin guy, I'll get the opportunity to to see you and share a football moment with you at uh, Homer Bryce Stadium on the campus in Nacogdoches. Looking forward to it. Back from Jack. There you go, baby. So – For now, for the now VIP alumni member of Stories Inside the Man Cave podcast, that being the Jonathan Shusky, and for the OG Man Cave boys, that being Hardball Hards, Big Mike, and Coach Mo, we are out. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. up. I'm in my car in the giddy up.